Martin Luther King's dream was for us to have our voting rights, civil rights, and all this. And there were some people that were left behind. In the 13th Amendment, it says no man can be held under involuntary servitude or in slavery except or by for what? Family conviction. Me and William Boyd started what's called the Backwards March in 2007. Because everybody, every year, you know, we've been going to this commemoration and everybody go from Mon Selma to Montgomery, Selma to Montgomery. But people got lax, you know. So we started the Backwards March because it said we had to go back and get some things right before we can actually move forward. Go back to the basis. Go back to the originality of creating equality for all. I'm Pastor Kenneth Sharpton Glasgow, Kenneth Glasgow. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I came to Dothan, Alabama approximately when I was 13 years old. I was born with my fingers, no fingers, just like this. And I come to find out that my mother was actually, um, was actually the stepdaughter of my father. It really threw me off. I don't even know how I felt at five years old trying to understand what that meant. Woo, since 78, we lived on the street. And so it started to really, really take effect on me that something was wrong with me. And it built um, a, a distrust and paranoia in me, and I would always try to hide my hand. And my stepdad, he, he beat me real bad, pulled a knife for me, and my mother and him fought. And I think that's when I really started to find my own way, even though it was the wrong way, because I felt like I got to protect my mother now, because she protected me. I found um, myself in the street, doing drugs and doing gang activity. A person don't get on drugs because they don't care. A person get on drugs because they do care. Low self-esteem and all, feeling like they're not worthy, feeling like they're handicapped or dysfunctional or mutant. A lot of people get on drugs to try to discard. A lot of people get on drugs to try to medicate. This is, this is the alley where I was at and did a lot of drugs, did a lot of transactions. I got in trouble at 14 years old showing a man that was a friend of my mother's. And he asked for some marijuana. I took him to go show him where he could buy or purchase marijuana. And the next thing I know, the guy came to school and he ended up being a narcotic agent that locked me up. They said they was gonna put me in this cell with this big dude named Isaac and Isaac gonna get you. Scared to death, I went in there and tried to beat Isaac up. And Isaac just literally picked me up, held me like a child, and said, somebody come get this guy for he hurt me or hurt himself. It made me not trust people too much. It made me very paranoid. I realized then that I was in a place that was very, very discarded. And I started selling drugs pretty heavy at that particular time. And I went to jail my 21st birthday. What people don't understand, when you go to jail, you go through processing. They strip you butt naked, you in front of everybody. And that's the first thing you remember is how humiliating it is. All your humanity has just been violated, it seems. And I turned around and, and, and got out and went right back to sell. This area here is where we used to stand on the corners and all that and sell drugs. And I got busted again, boom. The food in prison is some of the nastiest, blandest, unseasoned. You eat roadkill, and you know, and roadkill is like food to where you don't know what it is. I got out, I might have stayed out maybe two or three months, boom, I got busted. I woke up and blood was all over me. Check yourself. And when they holler, check yourself, you don't know if maybe somebody's gonna stab you while you sleep or somebody else that got stabbed because blood is everywhere. I got out again. My mother bombed me out. Pawned the house, pawned the car, pawned everything, get me out. And when I got out this time, I went right back out there selling drugs, selling drugs, selling drugs, selling drugs. 
doing drugs was very wrong. But it was the only thing that I had. I had been going driving trucks, this and that, and the other came back home, lost the dog on the job. Went right back. They put me in prison, I went from uh, this big tall sergeant, Sergeant P, I'm gonna say. Showed me his skull and bones. I'll never forget this 1994 on his left shoulder and said, if I kill you, you know how many points I get to kill you? And I got out. I got out, got right back on drugs, started selling drugs, started using drugs, started robbing. I had never robbed people in my life. I despise a thief. Like I said, a lot of people don't get on drugs just because they want to get out. A lot of people get on drugs to try to escape their reality. 14 different drug cases, two armed robberies, two or three batteries, and one grand theft. That's my record. That's my criminal record. But that's not my life record. And one of the things that the government has is to lock them up, lock them up, lock them up. People that are on drugs such as myself, people that got burglary charges, people that got low level uh, uh, property crimes, they need treatment, man. What makes us become a revolving door? You know what really does that is the collateral consequences. Even if we have the mindset to get out and do things differently and become a productive citizen, we can't get jobs because we mock this felons. Most of your housing applications, your apartment applications right now, what do they have on there? Same thing as the job application. Are you a convicted felon? Can't get proper health care to take care of yourself and all. So it leaves a person to result to their norm. And that's survival tactics, survival of the fittest. We just went through survival of the fittest in prison, trying to learn how not to be that. I had an epiphany with God in 1994 to do TOPS, the Ordinary People Society. I started to see things different. Like I could really make a difference and clean up where I messed up. And after a while, it started changing other people's lives and people started telling me about it. And that made me stay clean. In prison, I got all the Muslims, all the Hebrew Israelites, all the KKK, all the skinheads. We would study Monday was a KKK day, Tuesday was always for the Hebrew Israelites, Wednesday always, uh, you know, the Christian day. We started learning each other. We started out with about maybe 20 or 30 guys. It grew to about 300 of us. They put me in this dorm, then they sent me the M dorm, then they sent me the H dorm, then they sent me, and I was like, why are these people keep moving me? Why are they being so nasty to me? But I kept praying, I kept preaching. May 23rd, 2001, I went right back before Judge Bob Wallace, and he had this stack of papers, and the judge read these papers, and he said, this case, it's closed. I just knew my life was over. And that man hit that hammer, man. My whole life was gone. And he looked at me. He said, you don't know what just happened to you. I said, yeah, I know you're doing the book at me. I said, it's OK, this is what God got for me. He said, no. You free. I said, but look at all the letters and stuff the police wrote on me and the guards and all that. He said, you don't know what the letters was? I said, nah. He said, they were letters of recommendation. He said, most of them letters said that every time they would move you somewhere, you would change the atmosphere with all your preaching and stuff. So here we have the plaza, we call this Tops Plaza. This is where we have all the stuff to give people. Everything that people need when their house burn down, when people come out of prison. Every year we serve 450 children of incarcerated parents. We have NAAA every day, all kind of different classes. I do anger management myself on Wednesdays, resume building. This right here is the game room. And the kids wanted to signature it, not only with their names, but with their handprints as well. 
This is where we have service on Sundays. This is where we have our community meetings. This is the Proud Child Project. This is a one-stop shop. One-stop shop so somebody can come here and get themselves together. Prodigal for a, a son, when he lifted a ride to life, when he messed up, when he was out there doing wrong, and he came to his senses and he asked his father, he said, hey, let me come back home. What did his father do? His father received him with open arms. You know, prison only infests you uh, and bit makes you bitter. Uh, prison just really makes you feel more like an animal than a human being. What, what really got to me was my epiphany with God first and foremost, and then going through transition uh, treatment. That's what got me. And whenever I get discouraged, whenever I get feeling bad, I mean, he's back in the prison. And I tell them, brothers, y'all pray. So I'm on a mission for people, and that includes everybody. The things I've been through, I don't want nobody else to go through. The things that separate us, I don't want them to separate us. These are the things we must look at if you really want America, the beautiful, to be what it's supposed to be. I'm depending on you, the future of America, to get this thing right so you won't have to march backwards the next 50 years. God bless you.